welcome. Uh, I have a great job, uh, as Saul said, because I get to work half time in the emergency department and I also work half time in the ICU. And I find that each specialty has their own unique point of view. And so for me, when I'm in the emergency department, I have things that I want from my consultants upstairs. I want them to answer the phone promptly. Uh, I always hope they have beds. I hope for minimal screaming on the telephone. Uh, and at the same time, when I'm working upstairs in the other half of my job, I have things I want from the emergency department. I have things that I am hoping for. And so I'm here to tell you what some of those things are. But I want to be very clear. The point of this talk is not about pleasing the intensivist. It's to deliver excellent health care to these patients who need it the most, especially as they spend more and more time in our emergency departments. And that will have the happy side benefit of pleasing the intensivist. But the true goal here, as always, is about saving lives. So let's start with a case. And this patient arrived to see me with a severe COPD exacerbation. So severe, in fact, that I chose to intubate him, if only to stop him from having another cigarette. And after you intubate, it's flawless, you secure your tube, then you high five your team and you walk out of the room, right? Your job is done. But wait a second, is that right? Because maybe, in fact, I believe we have better resuscitation skills than that. And this is our time to demonstrate them. We know that early resuscitation makes a critical difference in outcomes. And so here is my ask. I want to ask you to spend an extra 10 minutes in the room. Stay an extra 10 minutes. Now I know this is a huge ask. We are legitimately busy people in the emergency department, but of all of the people you see in a shift, the one you just intubated is the one that needs that extra time the most. And it's true that this person cannot fill out a satisfaction survey, but we went into medicine to save people's lives. And this is a real opportunity to do so. So I want to tell you five different options of things you could spend that 10 minutes on. And for me at the very top of my list is to spend part of that time on basics of resuscitation. So after I've intubated, this is my moment where I pick up the ultrasound to decide, does this patient need a bit more fluid? I have a look at the IVC. I check that our IV access is adequate. You just want to take those few minutes to optimize your resuscitation. Somebody's putting in a Foley, hopefully. You also don't want to forget just basic things like the NG. The stomach is often full of air at this stage and aspiration can kill ICU patients. They can aspirate even around an inflated endotracheal tube balloon that does not provide perfect protection for them. So something as simple as inserting an NG can be life-saving. We know early antibiotics make a huge difference. Don't wait for your, I, for your ICU team upstairs, just start them yourself. Something simple like raising the head of the bed. This both decreases aspiration risk but it can also have a significant impact on hypoxia and respiratory mechanics in some patients, right? And we know this intrinsically. When somebody comes in to see you short of breath, they're never lying flat on their back, right? In fact, we call that at my place, that's the position of death. Uh, they're sitting bolt upright trying to breathe because it makes them easier. And even when you're intubated, having the head of your bed up makes it easier for you to oxygenate. Your patients will thank you for it. There are many options you can do to assist with this resuscitation. And most places people use a checklist for this. You can download one from whatever your favorite blog is, uh, but having something that makes sure you've hit all these high points can be really valuable in optimizing your patient's care. And so say you spend two, three or four minutes on those that first few pieces of resuscitation. I then have my second wish. And I want you to turn your attention to the ventilator. In fact, I want you to make friends with the ventilator. Uh, and on the upside, one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that it's given many ED providers a lot more training and comfort with ventilation, but I still want to recap the essential points here. Number one, titrate the FiO2 on the ventilator. You don't need a SAT of 100% for anybody. Somewhere around 92 to 96 is probably fine for the vast majority of your patients. You don't need to wait for a blood gas. 
You just look at their sat probe and you can turn the dial on your ventilator to adjust that FiO2 and watch the sat, just the same as you would titrate nasal prongs. But we know that avoiding hyperoxia is helpful for these patients. I also want you to think about the tidal volume you're delivering on the ventilator, because ideally we are giving most people lung protective ventilation, which means tidal volume somewhere between four to eight cc's per kilo. And per kilo, right? Is that their actual body weight we're using here? No, right? It's their ideal body weight. So you need their gender and their height to calculate that. But that's how we determine the body weight we're using for tidal volumes. That's the one that counts because your lungs don't actually care what your BMI is. Last but not least, hook them up to a continuous end tidal CO2 trace. When this has been studied, this is one of the key safety interventions that keeps emergency departments patients safer while they're intubated. The end tidal CO2 trace can tell you when the tube is dislodged. It can tell you when your ventilation strategy is inadequate. And this is a vital part of keeping these people safe. So spend a couple of your minutes in the room making sure your vent parameters are optimized for the patient because this makes a huge difference. All right, so you've spent a couple minutes on resuscitation, a minute or two with the vent. I now want you to consider your sedation strategy. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. This has happened to me before. I intubate somebody, I'm finishing up in the room and the nurse says, hey, do you wanna order something for analgesia or sedation? But I've really just intubated, like I just RSI'd them, they're still intubated and paralyzed. And I say, hey, just call me and I'll order you something. So then I leave the room and of course I get caught up in a trauma or a resuscitation and the nurse tries to reach me a few times, but I'm busy. And by the time I get back to that patient, they are awake and uncomfortable and struggling against the ventilator. And this is all totally preventable if you just put those orders in before you leave that patient. And so it's now my practice to do that every time because we can anticipate that this is gonna happen. When I am putting those orders in, I use an analgesia first strategy, which means I order pain meds first as my priority. We know many of our critical care interventions are painful for patients. The endotracheal tube can be uncomfortable, NGs are uncomfortable, central lines are uncomfortable, rib fractures from CPR, it's all painful. And if they don't get adequate pain control, we end up needing huge doses of sedation to keep them so sleepy that they don't feel pain. And that can lead to higher rates of ICU delirium and it can slow down getting people extubated. So start with analgesia first and then add something for sedation, like a benzodiazepine or maybe propofol. But optimizing their pain control helps lower ICU delirium rates and can get them out of the ICU faster. So this has an important impact on their length of stay. Okay, we're up to number four. I want to talk about peripheral pressors. And this is an increasingly common practice. I do this a lot myself. I think it's quite reasonable as long as you're doing it safely. So I want to just give you a couple tips on how to keep this safe. Number one, you need a big IV, right? Ideally an 18 gauge or something even bigger than that, but probably more important than the size is where you put it. These IVs should not be in the hand, they should not be in the wrist and maybe not even in the AC fossa where you can bend the elbow and increase your risk of extravasation. So when you're thinking about running a peripheral presser, you can put the IV in the forearm or maybe even up top like a midline, but you want it in a safe proximal site. The reason for this is we want to avoid extravasation. When our vasopressors extravasate, they cause ischemic necrosis. And this can happen with any of your vasopressors, including phenylephrine. And this is a rare event. It doesn't happen often. I've only seen a few of them in my career. But when it does happen, it is devastating. So this was a woman who was transferred into me. She had peripheral pressors running for a few hours. And this is an 18 gauge IV. It's a pretty good size, but it's in her wrist. And when your presser first starts to extravasate through that vasoconstriction, the skin is gonna get white and cool compared to the other side. And that's the time to catch it when it's still readily reversible. 
after it's gone on for a few hours, the skin starts getting darker and swollen, the way you see in this picture here. And at this stage, it's much harder to do anything about it. So as soon as we saw this, we stopped the presser, we put some fentolamine down the line and in the subcutaneous tissues, but she was already dark and cool and swollen. And in the emergency department, if you're not checking that site, if the hand is tucked under the blankets, we can easily miss this. It doesn't look so bad on day one, right? She's a bit dark there, but by day three, even with never using that site again, her hand looks like this and she ended up with a mid forearm amputation. These cases are rare, but this is devastating for patients to survive your ICU stay and end up with a mid forearm amputation is awful. So please think hard about your IV access and in particular where you have put that IV. I will run peripheral pressors, but I want a big line. I want it proximal and you've got to check the site. So at our place, it comes with a pre-built order set where you're comparing your site to the contralateral side every hour for color, temperature, and perfusion, because you want to catch it while it's still blanching, while it's still cool and white. And you have to notify the doc for any asymmetry so they can come stop the presser, move it somewhere safer, and give some fentolamine. All right, last but not least, in the 10 minutes you're spending on this patient, I have a very quick ask about communication. And most of the time, the communication I get from my emergency medicine colleagues is fantastic. Uh, they always have such a good grasp of the clinical scenario, but there are two areas where I want a tiny bit more detail. Number one is around the code status. And I'll tell you a story. I had a case like this earlier this year. So a patient comes into the emergency department in cardiac arrest. There's no family there. We don't know who the patient is. In fact, they're a John Doe still at that stage. And the eMERGE doc does a fabulous job. They intubate, they resuscitate, they get ROSC, and the patient comes up to the ICU. But really, like the eMERGE doc saved that patient's life. And in their charting, they wrote full code. And they had assumed that it was full code, which is the appropriate assumption, because uh, there was nobody to confirm with. But it didn't say that there was no one to confirm with. It just said full code. So up in the ICU, we find the family, they come in and I'm the first one to meet them. Uh, and so I go to meet the family to say, hey, great news. You know, Uncle Joe is going to do fine. He's been fully resuscitated. And I'm blindsided when the family pulls out DNR documents. And of course, they're all lawyers and they're mad and we look like idiots. I spend the next week trying to smooth everything over and avoid a lawsuit. And so... What I want around code status is I want a few more words. I want who you confirmed with. So write full code confirmed with the doctor or uh, full code as per the chart or assumed full code, nobody there to talk to. All of that is perfectly okay. I just need that extra few words on how you got that information because it completely changes how we will approach the families around this. My second ask around communication is a couple more details about your intubation. Most of my colleagues will write something about their technique, the approach they used, but what I really want to know, was this an easy airway or a difficult airway? As in, did your medical student get this on the first try? That's easy. Uh, or did it take you four tries? That's harder. The reason why this matters is when a week later we're trying to extubate somebody, if we know they were an easy intubation, we will often extubate them sooner, sometimes as much as a day sooner. That piece of information makes a huge difference for those patients. So if you just write easy airway, that lets us get that tube out possibly a day sooner, which is a huge thing. Okay, in summary. I want you to spend an extra 10 minutes in the room. It makes such a huge difference for these critical patients. You can spend it on resuscitation and check, running your checklist, making sure your vent parameters are optimized, going with an analgesia first strategy. It's okay to use a peripheral presser. You just wanna have a big proximal line and make sure you're checking that site regularly and document a few more words on your intubation and your code status. These really make a difference for these patients, and that's truly the goal here. Thanks so much for listening.